we will go from there. Welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. We're live. Uh, how's everybody doing? Good. Good. So I have uh, for, I have the usual suspects. Some of the usual suspects: Bridget, Brenmar, Pete, Matt, uh, and then I've got some guys who are working on something called the Deep Ones, or excuse me, the Elder Ones Multimedia Project. And so we'll get to those guys in a minute. Um, and uh, Pete's a part of that project. Um, so. Bridget and Matt, let's start with you. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves? And I know you have a prize, Matt. Um, I do. My name is Matt Carpenter. Um, our prize today is a really nice omnibus comic. Uh, the Cal McDonald Mysteries Omnibus Volume 1. So this has the art by Ben Temple Smith, which is pretty cool. If you want to win this prize, all you have to do is send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com, put macabre into the subject heading, and we draw a winner in like five to six weeks, and who knows, it could be you. All right, Bridget. Hello, I'm Bridget Brenmark. I am a, a composer and artist and horror fan. And then Pete. Hi, I'm Pete Rollick. I write things and I read a lot of books and, you know, you know just do crazy things most of the time. And sometimes bad movies sometimes, mainly is what you're going to watch. Bad movies will be on your tombstone. Yeah, I watch a lot of bad movies. <laughs> um, yep, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, if you're watching live, um, there's a little dollar sign down at the bottom. You can tip me if you want, or I've got the Patreon link, um, and also have the uh, I've got the Patreon link in the in the show notes, and uh, also have the PayPal link. So um, keep the lights on. If you, I mean, I'd appreciate it. And uh, let's see here. What else do we have? Um, I think that's it for now until let, let's let's introduce you guys. Um, let, let's start with, you know, just names and a really like like a, a very brief bio and then let's get into the project. So, um, Jason, let's start with you. OK, um, well, I'm Jason Wallach. Um, I've been doing the Unquiet Void now for uh, since uh, 1989 and uh, since 2004. Uh, have been working on a um, mythological uh, cycle uh, of albums uh, based on the works of H.P. Lovecraft, which brings us to this project. All right. So, uh, Steve. Uh, yeah, it's Steve Mashak, uh, full-time weirdo, part-time artist. Uh, <laughs> I've been working with uh, Fred uh, Lubno on our uh, Lovecraftian science books for the past few years. Then recently, I got involved with Jason on his project. Uh, a lot of people watching live. One of them is 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 Chelsea, and she says that she's missed us. Thanks, I missed you guys too. We had to take a couple of weeks off for various reasons. So glad to be back. Um, and if for those of you watching live or watching later. Uh, not if you're listening, of course, but if you look at my background, that's Steve's artwork right there. One, one of his pieces for this uh, this project. So it's pretty neat. Let me get out of the way here. You can see some of it. The Unquiet Void. And then, why, hey, why'd they put P. Rollick's name on that? I don't know, but it's, my name is smaller than Fred's. So. Yeah, that's what, that, I think they did that on purpose. Yeah. I mean, Steve did that on purpose, yeah. Yeah. No, Steve. no, 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 yeah. never. Steve, yeah. No, it's all has to do with spacing and everything. My name is like much bigger than Fred's. Okay. Well, I, I have to massage Fred's ego. So that's what that's, that's, <laughs> there you uh, go. Speaking of Fred and his ego, you want to introduce yourself, Fred? Hello, I'm Fred Lubno. Um, during the day, I'm a, a limnologist, which is a lake scientist, but at night, work a lot on the Lovecraftian uh, science stuff. Um, we are getting our third volume out. It's extremely late, but it's, it's at the editors now. Uh, but at the last Necronomicon, uh, Jason approached Steve and I 
uh, about collaborating on this great project. So that's why we're here. Yeah, actually, if you Google, just Google Lovecraftian science, and you'll, uh, uh, Fred stuff, I'm sure will be right at, right at the top. Um, last name is, it's Fred and last name is spelled L-U-B-N-O-W. Um, I, I, I linked on the uh, Facebook page as well as the chat on YouTube for Lovecraftian science. Okay, thanks. Uh, it's, thanks, Matt. It's really fascinating stuff, it really yeah. is. So, thank you, appreciate that. Al, want to introduce yes. yourself? Yeah, I'm Al Baldwin. Uh, in my prior, I'm retired now. In my prior life, I was a senior scientist and uh, computer systems engineer uh, for the mostly for the Department of Defense. So we'll leave that. But I've been doing and dabbling electronic music for a number of years uh, with a with a tendency towards the darker side, inspired by uh, my 12 year old and when I was 12 encounter with the Dunwich Horror, which got me hooked. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the blue, uh, this guy named Jason magically appeared. And I had prior to that, I had a couple of years, I'd encountered one of his CDs hunted outside and was like, was totally blown away and said, this is, this is the way Lovecraft should sound rather than death metal and tentacles. So and all of a sudden, there yeah. it was, and yeah. off we went. Yeah, so. for 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 those who don't know what I was talking about, that's that's Jason's um, music. And if you Google Google the Unquiet Void, and uh, and you'll find that. And if you're watching, Matt, um, put Jason's website in the comments t as well. So in the in the live comments, um, Pete, let's head back to you and because you're involved with this project as well and then i'll let you maybe get the ball rolling and and ask everybody about their role and how this project got started and and so forth great so i came in on the tail end of this okay. um jason and i had talked you're still not off the hook though yeah no i <laughs> jason, jason and i had talked a couple years ago and he had sent me some music and and I had really enjoyed it and, you know, written some things in response to it, just little, you know, what I think of as, as blip verts, just like four or five sentences of, uh, of words inspired by some of his, his, his uh, music. Um, and, uh, you know, he, every time he produced something, he would send me a link to it. And I was like, oh, this is really, really cool. I've got a couple of those albums on my shelf this, that, and the other thing. And then I guess, was it about a year ago? Maybe even, yeah. was it a year ago? He yeah. sent me a link to a new project where, and it was sort of this expansive Lovecraftian opera. <laughs> it's the only way I can think of it, you know, detailing the, the arrival, the, the rise and, and the inevitable fall of, of the elder things. And I was like, this is really cool. And can I write the liner notes? Yeah, because the the one of the taglines for this, obviously written by Lovecraft that Jason sent to me was of the life of the old ones, both under the sea and after part of them migrated to the land, volumes could be written. Um mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, the think of the audience out there, guys, or all of you involved with this project, and they, they ask a very simple question, what is this? I mean, what, what's the answer? And I, and I know it's not maybe a simple answer, but that's okay, because it's a really cool project. It's a multimedia project. I hope Jason has an answer. <laughs> Jason, okay. do you know what this is? <laughs> yes. I mean, <laughs> what, it, what it started Yes. Not even, not even the creator knows what it is, <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good kind thing. of acquired a life of its own. <laughs> it, it really, it really has. It's you know, it's um, it it's kind of like in that quote from Lovecraft, um, a continuation from the uh, the 2018 album Secrets of Anishians, which was originally supposed to be the name for the entirety of the exploration of at the Mountains of Madness. Um, since uh, I hadn't had an album out in five years at that point. Um, and that particular album was about 12 years in the making. I wanted to get that done. And then 
when that was finished, it was just sort of like, okay, well, what's next? And that quote is really, it, it's those volumes could be written is really what these next two albums are, is what this project is. What so, you wrote to me was, I asked you for like one to two lines, just yes. so that I could understand the, the just a bit of it. Right. And what you wrote to me, I've got it in front of me, you said it's a multimedia exploration of the earth history of the elder things the story yeah. behind at the mountains of madness so yes so that is uh al and i handled the music the sampling and sound design um and then steve i mean when i ran into uh fred and steve um al had introduced me to fred's science journal and i read you know he said uh, it was something about the uh the interstellar travel of the elder things using dark energy and then dark, you know, matter within the, well, dark matter energy within the matter and then the currents within the energy. And it, that kind of blew my mind because I was looking for a way to approach because each album is approached differently. Um, there's, you know, obviously there's no reason to approach a different album, the same, you know, any two albums the same way. So it became this sort of like, this moment where you know realizing that that fred just gave it plausibility like scientific plausibility and that really interested me and so al and i decided to that's how we were going to approach the the audio aspect of this and um funny enough uh, i got in touch with fred and said uh, you know is there any way that we can incorporate like in our liner notes it was going to be a cd with like a whole booklet at one point and um you know, if we could, if we could accompany this album with some of what you wrote, because this, this is really inspiring the direction we're taking it in. And he said, yeah, you know, let me, let me take a look. We can expand on some things. So at Necronomicon, I meet Fred and Steve come up to the table and Steve opens this laptop and he's got this amazing picture of these, these elder things like, you know, sort of like entering Earth's atmosphere and, and sort of coming down into the water. And what really blew my mind about that was it's, it, it looks exactly how I pictured it. And he had heard the music, he had done this image. And I mean, that pretty much was that. Um, they were on board and they were pretty much kind of like waiting to do something like this. I, I think they were going to do a graphic novel. They can expand on that. And so we just decided to pool our efforts and make a visual... Um, a literary, scientific, audio project, uh, fully immersing people into the uh, earth history of the elder things, you know, the breadcrumbs that Lovecraft gave us in the story, and really kind of looking at the story behind At the Mountains of Madness and fleshing it out and making it a, um, an environment that people can actually experience what happened. So... You know, what I love about this is, is first of all, the Lovecraftian community is, is as, as, as all of us know, a really welcoming community. But, you know, Fred's got this Lovecraftian science project going. You've got your music going. You know, uh, Al, Steve, Steve's um, artwork is amazing. I've seen it before and <laughs> linked to you before, Steve. Um, but, you uh, each each of you bringing something to the table and you know pete as well um so it that's what i love about this project um before we go on and i want to let pete ask some questions but i think the the sixty four thousand dollar question is when will it be available for folks to purchase or or how's this going to work Next, uh, we are aiming at uh, Necronomicon 2022. Okay. So roughly what, a year. What, okay, so you've got all this multimedia stuff. What actually is the format that you expect to release this in? Well, how are you going to no. like, it's so many different things all at once. That's what I'm kind of curious about. How are you going to like sort of bundle it together so people can get a total experience? Well, the, the album, what we want to do is have a book with the CDs in it and all three of them, like uh, the Secrets of Vanished Neons, because the Elder the elder Ones continues directly from the end of that album. 
Um, so there, there is no, you know, uh, separation of these three parts. So it's, it, it's pretty much being done in thirds. And um, it's going to have, the book is going to have, you know, the, the wonderful, wonderful uh, writing that uh, Pete has done for you to introduce the different phases of this whole process. Look, then I was drinking a lot. I just, you know, just to be clear, <laughs> you know. It, it was good of you. It was good of you to ask him onto this project. I mean, he he's done some really great. Very rarely finds anything to do. A narrative component. Yeah. <laughs> well, he actually asked me, and and I said absolutely. You know, here's the format um, of the you know because it happens in stages. And see, the thing is with the audio, what we've done is is Al and I and Al did a lot of legwork on this is we mapped out the earth history and we took the bits and pieces that Lovecraft gives us in the story. And we lined it up with that, with that, um, that chronology. So in some of the tracks you're going to hear, you know, like you'll hear magnetic storms, rain. Um, in one of the tracks on disc two, you'll hear dinosaurs, you know, it's, it's various periods um, through the earth's history. And we were, ver we've been very meticulous in lining everything up, making it so that it's, you never hear the same things twice. It's always something new and something moving and alive and organic. And it's- We use a uh, lot of like organic sounds too. It's like so many times, you know, things that drive me crazy, you know, in my part of the music world is people will use synthesizer or, or, or whatever to imitate the sound of crickets, for instance, is a famous thing I, I encountered once. And it's like the guy had like thousands of dollars worth of equipment sounding like a cricket, which didn't really sound like a cricket. It sounded like electronic things doing the cricket. So I went online and downloaded a cricket. But a lot of the sounds we have in, in during the course of the work where there's a Holocaust, we use actual volcanic eruptions. We use tidal waves. We use Arctic winds. We use weird sounds from animals. So Part of, part of what we're striving for, like when Jason says, an immersive experience, is that it's it believable. You know, you you actually it sounds like the real thing, and you know, and rather than you know, uh, like I said, Lovecraftian death metal guys with painted faces stuff. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Got some questions you want to throw out there? What, what so, did you, okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so, I, okay, so the last I heard we were doing this on a laser disc, but I guess that's that's done. Uh, eight track <laughs> is what I heard. Betamax. <laughs> yeah, some cassettes, yeah. You know, you know, El, uh, vinyls come back, but what I really wish would come back is, is eight track. Wouldn't that be cool? Or am no, I alone? Because, am I alone in this? Okay, so. <laughs> the thing with, with LPs and CDs and you, you know, or even, you know, DVDs or whatever is that it functions as a book. You can put text in there and you can put paper in there, but with eight tracks and you just can't, there was no casing. Fine. I'll let go of the dream. You know, so <laughs> I mean, I get it. Yeah. I had a hot tuna eight track tape when I was a kid. I didn't have a player, but I had a I had a tape. <laughs> didn't know what I was gonna do with it, but hey, whatever. But okay, so um, Steve. Yes. What is where do you draw your inspiration from? And and because first of all, you never stop. I think uh, I don't think a day goes by when I don't see a new piece of artwork in front of you. I have no life, so that helps. Um, <laughs> I mostly just get inspiration just from uh, the music and, and and Lovecraft's writing. But my, yeah, my it's take weird. on this we started, you know, in the early days, you know, Jason and I are conjuring and Fred and Steve. Go ahead. My take on this was that. It's 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 really us as elder things going through the history. It's that so that was my take for the art. Good, yeah. Wow. Yeah, we started sending him notes, and you know, because Jason and I were working on a roadmap, 
you know, drawing a lot on Fred's stuff. Oh. And what uh, my first impression with Steve was that we had, you know, Jason and I had talked and roughed in some ideas about some of the early events and roughed in some sounds. And uh, Jason <clears throat> forwarded that to Steve. And, you know, I'd seen this art in the Lovecraft and Science, Science Journal, so that was good. But what freak, totally freaked me out and continues to freak me out is that his, uh, what everything he does is spot on to our wildest visions and highest hopes and worst pairs. So, so wait, know, I, I got a question. feel for it, you know? I, I got kind of a question. Okay, now this may be a little off the wall, okay. Uh, some years back, I was reading an article in Scientific American, American about the sensory world of the platypus and how you would try and depict that in a picture that a human could understand how the platypus was exploring its world with a magnetic and electronic waves with its bill. And it was really a very striking, like almost a, almost a probability map. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I was just wondering, are you doing things that are like, this is how the elder things perceive their world? You know, because what their sensorium has to be different, right? Uh, we didn't get into that yet, no. We're, we're just uh, depicting the events, more or less. Yeah, that's intriguing, though. Yeah, yeah and I, I think the music, if anything, really that would, yeah, does that, would get into does that, that really, really yeah, that's where we try that, to do the that. alien feel of the history of the Elder Things. One of the things I like about Steve's work is that uh, whether it's by accident or because Fred's tutored him or, or he figured it out, I see in a lot of art, I see the elder things and their great race assuming very anthropocentric forms. Yeah. And that is so antithetical to what Lovecraft wanted. He was trying to create real aliens. Okay. See, I, I got to interrupt you real quick piece. and say that somebody commented on, I think it was the big, big Facebook page of that when I posted one of Steve's elder uh, thing images, they're like, this is great. You know, an alien that doesn't look like a person could fit inside of a costume. And do this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it looks like a vegetable. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like a crinoid vegetable. Yeah. An oak, giant okra with tentacles. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Pete actually did that, you know, when you were writing about um, how those monstrosities interacted with the humans in an aggressive attack posture mm -hmm. in a way that no one else had tried to describe where they were like actually, as it were, sort of tipped on their side. Right. Business end coming forward at speed using their wings. Right. I, I really that was think a really that, unusual way to depict it compared to what everyone else has written. Yeah. So just, just to, to, to skirt into that, I really think that these, the elder things, if they existed, would function in, in multiple ways based on whatever their behaviors were. So if you're moving through water or space or the air, you're flying. If you're casually walking around and, and doing some you know, delicate manipulation, you're, you're up on your, your lower tentacles and handling things with your upper tentacles, but your wings are folded in, so you wouldn't even see those. But then, you know, if you're in a threat position, you would assume what I think of as a predatory stance. You, this animal is the top predator. It's smart. It's, it's smarter than we are. And yeah. you, it has jet propulsion. It has lots of tentacles. And yeah, it's going to leap through the air at you. But to do that, it's got to be facing you. And that might be the only time where it focuses all of its eyes, all five eyes, plus all of its other sensors in a forward position. Other times, you know, those eyes are, you know, I, I think a lot of like anemones and scallops and starfish, those eyes are looking in a lot of different directions. It, it functions in a 3D universe. It's not uh, on a plane. It's looking up and down. And so 
yeah, those eyes are looking everywhere. Even if, if it's holding a gun on somebody, it wants to know what's coming around. I think Steve has done a really good job of capturing that feel. It seems almost impossible to even imagine, you know, we see from this direction, but that 360 vision and how your brain would process it. You guys, uh, Pete and Fred could speak to that far better than me, of course, but just, you know, thinking about that. Well, so one of the things I talk about is, is in, a, in one of my books is that how the brain is pentaradial. You know, the whole animal is pentaradial. The brain probably is as well. And it probably has a central thing that brings everything together, but then five where we're by, we have a bicameral brain. This thing has five parts that it's got to link together, but well, there's well, a good reason. Even like that. stretch it to like an octopus where there's an intensive neurological system within each tentacle. Yeah, yes. Like the, you know, that it's sort of in its own way is independent of the central whole. Right. So, and you don't but, know what other senses they have. Like um, perhaps those uh, five eyes can work together and see in four dimensions, not three. Well, there's, there's, I think of there, there's the eyes and then there are these cilia that are on the, the, the arms of the eyes that I think of as, you know how we have cones and rods. And I think that we also have something, a third thing now that they, they, they talk about. But I think that the eyes might function as black and white and then the, the cilia might function as color. Mm-hmm. To, say nothing of, uh, to say nothing of the, the different, the, you know, we can only see a limited part of the, right. the light spectrum. Right. You know, there's that too. Right. And then there's, there's, so there's this other thing is, and, and this is where Fred and I are going to go, go kind of geeky. Um, I'm a big deep sea fisherman. And, you know, when you go deep sea fishing, the colors in the fish usually go to, go to black and red and dark mostly because there's not a lot of light down there Mm -hmm. and it's physiologically cheap to make red over black but because there's not a lot of light you still get the same effect you're still dark so there's this idea that i have that with the elder things when they're in, in deep water they're seeing a lot less, a lot more light than we would, that even angler fish would, because they're using a whole bunch of different senses. And maybe some of those senses are electromagnetic. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. So, but we, I haven't, we haven't talked about that. <laughs> but well, those are the sorts uh, of things we're exploring in our yes. work right? at yeah. all That's, different levels. And yeah. this is why you have Steve Mastruck illustrate your project and you know something else i want to say about steve's work that has really helped inspire me with some of the writing is how he puts a high level of detail in terms of the background for so you know as i'm writing this i'm going through the eons the era the periods i'm going from basically when the earth the universe was created the earth cooled elder things came to earth, I'm going right up until about 2 million years, which is around when the elder things went into hibernation and pre, pre-dawn of, of humans. And um, as I go through these periods, I'm writing pieces and parts of them, a lot of the inspiration comes from the music. A lot of it's coming from the scripture of Pete. So a lot of the information that he's provided, I'm using to describe what's going on in a certain period, like the Cambrian or the Devonian. Um, but Steve puts that detail of whatever era or period you're in, you can see, oh, we're not in the, do- we're pre-Devonian because there are no fish around. You know, it's stuff like that. I love that detail that he provides. Who had the scripture of Pete phrase on their <laughs> bingo card for this episode? <laughs> so when I wrote, is. <laughs> when I, I was trying to write this as somewhere between history and poetry and scripture yeah. and you know it came up to me as you know looking at you know i pulled up the thesaurus and just like looking through and i was like oh my god it's a psalm <laughs> and you know a collection of psalms is, is called a psalmody 
And so that's what it is. It's a psalmody. Yep. And, you know, I, I like that idea that this is something that fits into all three or four of those categories. Um, because, you know, it's music. It's, go ahead. Sorry. It, it's funny you should mention because even when really the first thing I, I worked on for the project was Arrival. And that was originally a track that I had um, just kind of uh, temporarily labeled or titled uh, Rapture because of the way it sounded. It was almost like this kind of like, it, 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 it just had this, this feeling to it, like this almost like biblical kind of uh, darkness. Um, and so I changed it to Arrival because that's what it is. But it's so funny that you should say that it, you know what you what you had just said was that it's um, you know like a song kind of. Mm -hmm. I mean, wow! I mean, this and and see, it's like now with this project, it's like the music inspires the art, inspires the music, inspires the writing, inspires the science, inspires yeah. the. And this thing is like you know like uh, Norris in the thing. The head melts off the leg grow and it just saunters off you know i mean it's like right. it's insane the way this project is i mean i think grown and out of like all of our expectations it just keeps <laughs> leveling up it's um it's it's pretty ri pretty ridiculous we've been working on it since 2018 uh did you do a kickstarter for this how are you financing this if i can ask or if it's just your vast uh, I saw monetary resources, then that's yeah, all you gotta say too. doing what we need to do. Yeah. We're doors. I mean, this is <laughs> this is what, this is what we do. I mean, it's you know, it, originally my I had a project going which was going to be a trilogy. Poison Dreams was the um, putting into motion the uh, the beginning of the end. The Shadow Haunted Outside unequivocally was the end. So then, what's left? You have to go back to the beginning. And so then it became, you know, this is what that became. But you really can't do Mountains of Madness justice in the way that I wanted to do it with just an album and like a list of themes for different events. Um, no, I had to go and uh, and just and, and, and get in it as though I were there watching it unfold. And that was really the whole the whole thing. So, I mean, the, the, the funding really comes from on my part. Um, I already had the software. I had the, you know, the tools to work with though minimal. Um, it, it's, it's kind of like, you know, making a movie like the evil dead, the less resources you have at your disposal, the more creative and precise you have to be with what you want uh, your project to be in terms of, you know, bringing it across to other people. Um, and, you know, being an audio project, it has to constantly move. It has to evolve and resolve and just, you know, you've got to, you know, the story scripted out. So each piece has to evolve and resolve and then also tell the greater arc. And so each album has that each track within the, within the, the pieces and then the overall piece and then the overall three discs of this thing. And I mean, you know, Fred and Steve, I mean, Steve is really, you know, Steve is one of, is like a force of nature. I mean, you bring Steve on board, not because you want to tell him what needs to be done. You bring Steve on board because he knows damn well what he needs to do. Um, it's, it's such a, if I didn't have these guys on this project, I guarantee you, I, I probably never would have done it. It's, it's too much. <laughs> so, so one of the things that you, there's, look, I love Shagas. I absolutely love Shagas. And I love the idea. And I have, I have my whole theories behind. Uh, I have, somewhere I have a, a book about, um, I mentioned a book like on, on the Shagatham, where somebody has gone through and done the classification and speciation of all the various Shagath things. 
so I, I've thought about this a lot. And one of the things that Steve has done with the Shagoths is there's this just in the ocean, this globular Shagoth just floating there, doing nothing, just sitting there as a sphere. And just, it's horrifying in size and, and appearance and simplicity. Because when you're in a medium and you're not doing anything, you just as, uh, assume the, a spherical shape because it's the most um, uh, efficient. It's just efficient to be a sphere. It's got the maximum sur uh, volume to the minimal surface area. And I had never thought about that. I mean, I know it. We, we know it as, as, as scientists that this is how things happen. But to see a Shagath just hanging there in the ocean, surrounded by the elder things, and it's just not doing anything. And so, a Shagath at relaxation. Is, <laughs> Shagath at rest. Yeah. Is kind of terrifying. Very, yeah. <laughs> Very, when you think about it. Incidentally, the title of Pete's next short story. <laughs> <laughs> I got the rest. Well, it's kind of interesting. You th remember uh, Elizabeth Bear's famous story, Shagoths in Bloom? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, they're, they're not doing anything. They're just sort of sitting on the island doing nothing. Right. Making little fruiting bodies. That's really about it. They just sit there, not eating anything, <laughs> not exchanging energy, not moving. Right. That's very right. similar. Well, I think yeah. for this, we wanted organism, not monster. You know, we were, we were very specific mm -hmm. on on handling it in a scientific vein, you know, uh, yeah. practically. And, um, and so therefore it was definitely the emphasis on organism because monsters are so much more, uh, I mean, you could really make or break something with that, but there's, there's no losing. I mean, it really, I mean, since Fred inspired me so much with the, this, his scientific explanation i mean that's just really the the road we had to take with it and then steve just i mean come on just knocked it out of the park some of the artwork he's done is just you just look at it you could look at one of his his pictures for for hours and probably still not see everything you're meant to see it's amazing yeah and part that touches on something mike that you kind of touched on and, and pete peter kind of touched on that was important to, to me anyway. And when Jason and I first started, you know, the, the, the standard thing is these, these are all monsters or gods or whatever, whatever. But part of what Jason and I tweaked to, as we started talking about this and why we wanted to do that and this, what did we want to do? These things are aliens. They're beings, which, and then, you know, one of the things that emerged, for instance, especially you can see it in, and Steve's art, and then, you know, Fred provides scientific backing for it, and Jason and I try to conjure it up. They had art, they had culture, they had science, uh, they waged war, you know, they had, there were politics involved. They're much more complex than just the tentacle, you know, the tentacle slimy thing that too many of the attempts at whatever in the mythos reduced them to. They're, they're very, very high, like you said, they're very high, they're smarter than we are. They're very highly cultured and, you know, they're, they're, they're beings. They're not, you know, monsters and all that other crap. So that's part of what, what we try to bring out. And, you know, all the, all the folks you're looking at here, you know, and especially it's, it's really easy to see in Steve's artwork because they, you know, people, they look like they're, you know, here they are, here's one walking down the street with this kid, you know, but <laughs> Yeah, you know, but they but they're they're thinking, feeling, artistic, political, you know, okra. Yeah, well, whatever. at the end, toward the end of um of at the mountains of madness, he even says, whatever they were, they were men. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's my favorite line. The, the other thing from a promotional yeah. standpoint, um, no matter who started the project, you know, Jason, the point of contact really for anybody interested in this or who who becomes interested in this is 99% of the time going to come from oh wow what cool artwork what is this you know yeah. and then they're going to go from there 
to mm -hmm. all the other cool things associated with this project. Exactly. Yeah. The, the, the stuff we put out, you know, very much bear, you know, proves that out. You know, well, this thing has ten. This thing has tentacles of it of its own. I mean, it's you know, it really doesn't matter how you get there. It matters that you get there. That's yeah. that, that's how I look at this project. I mean, if the artwork draws you in, awesome, because we are. It's it's this project is very much a hive mind. Um, we really draw on. We we draw on the source material, which is the anti misfits, and if. I mean, it, it's, we just, it, it circulates. It, it's just not even something we have to talk about. It's just, yeah. we, we understand it and we do it. I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. So uh, there's, there's something Fred said, you know, when we were talking, you know, and this goes back a while. So I may be remembering correctly, but we, we talked about how the elder things might drift over the course, you know, genetic in appearance at, at over billions of years that the ones that went toward this spiral arm and the ones that went toward the other spiral arm they're still elder things but they might be green or they might be blue or their ridges might be different their wings might have evolved differently and you know, just like humans you know just just yeah. like humans well, they but created that, <laughs> it and that perhaps when, when and if they encountered each other, they wouldn't be that friendly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you've, you've touched on this before, Pete, that, um, how do I say that, that why do we assume that they're all on the same side? Yeah, yeah this is, exactly. This, is, this has been one of my problems with, with Call of Cthulhu is that it's humans versus everything else. Yeah. And the, the thoughts that, and, and we talk about it, in, it, it comes out in the music and the books that the elder things don't get along with the my go and they don't get along with the yes and you know, or the Zothians, the, the Cthulhu species. Um, there are full outs, you know, You're worldwide the Richard war. Tierney character, uh, territory. <laughs> Yeah, uh -huh. um, yeah, but you but, know, like even in even in Lovecraft's work, if you look at uh, Dreams in the Witch House, the way he's describing an elder thing there, yeah, it's slightly little, different. It's slightly than different at the Mountains of Madness, and right. you can almost see this this other subspecies or eventually species of elder things, and they've taken to you know worship a different god or being compared to the very. Um, materialistic, you know, uh, mechanistic style elder things that came to earth. So very different. And, and it's interesting because again, Steve's artwork really helps to inspire, but then Pete, some of your stuff has, has made me think of um, the cone shaped beings. Well, yeah, they were earthbound creatures. I'm thinking there might be more than one species of those and that the Yithians may have entered the minds of the ones in the ocean, but maybe there were ones on land that were still cone-shaped beings that eventually went extinct or were preyed upon. Um, so even just on earth, I see this separation of species that may have been initiated by some being on land, some being in the ocean, but then whether some were, their minds were, were transferred out and Yithians took over, you know, how that interplayed. Right, so I recently, re -read, I recently reread that story and they talk about how they're having children, but they're not Yithian children. They're mm -hmm. the cone-shaped children. Right, yeah. Who are just going to be occupied by other members, you know, they're breeding their own cattle mm -hmm. to occupy. <laughs> yeah, um, and it's kind of it's let let it's very twisted, um, and you know it's it's kind of weird, but it it's the way it is, you know. And that's we never talk about how long the cones live, mm -hmm. um, but you could see I could see one of the yith jumping through dozens of cones. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. You'll hear. You'll hear it. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're working we're working with some of that now as a matter of fact. It's just yeah. Um Oh yeah. Uh, just, <laughs> I mean, it's those subtle details that that really disturb me sometimes. And yeah, go ahead. no, it's I, I, it's you so hit a nerve with me with that. You know, it's disc two, disc one was pretty straightforward because you know the main just sort of like flow of things is that they travel here, they arrive here, they develop the planet and then they run into the zothians they have these just millions of years of of uh, warring with them and then they you know that that situation is resolved that's the most that lovecraft gives you in the sort of you know kind of how the the expedition you know pieces together the uh the information about what happened to them from looking at the bar reliefs and the sculptures and the murals and things like that so the second the second disc was like well okay great now we have to include the the, the great race of yith we have to include the migo and then we have to bring it round full circle to the beginning of the secrets of vanished eons when it you know when we're back in the um in the dead city and how the hell are we going to do that? You know, I mean, there's there's just not enough information given. And so what Al did was he dug around in other stories, like the Whisper in Darkness, you know, like all the dreams in the witch house. And he got bits and pieces of all, you know, the, these these creatures and, and, you know, from from those stories and from that alone. And what we know of the mythology we piece together this sort of this event that would bring them to their, you know, near extinction and to them going into, uh, into hibernation and waiting, you know, after, and then it also touches on the creation of humans. It also touches on, on, on those disturbing details. And, and one of the things is, you know, we, we hit the ground running with this too, because the very first piece is, the transference of Yidian in consciousness into like limpet based organisms. And that was completely inspired by just this amazing image that Steve had done. And so then you hear, okay, you know, you have to take into consideration if one of these things transfers its consciousness into another living being and hopes to mobilize this thing, it can't kill it. And it has to re configure it to its own means so it's i mean there's just this piece at the beginning where you hear the transference and you hear the breaking and reconfiguring of these organisms while they're still alive and um you know to, to shape these cone the cone shaped creatures and it's uh it's just you know I, I, it's, I, Steve, we couldn't do it without you, man. Just, <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, in your opinion, guys, is the transference, is it trans, is the consciousness transferred or is it copied? Transferred. It's transferred. Transferred. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And um, a lot of the stuff that I wrote about this in the past was based on a lot of the stuff that uh, Michu Kaku talked about in terms of. Um, if we could download our consciousness and if there were, you know, way stations through the universe where there were mechanical devices that you could transfer your consciousness, you know, through space into that machine, that may be the only efficient way to do intergalactic travel. So that to right. me sounded a lot like what the Yithians do, but more on a biological level. So I, I think I, I, like everyone else is saying. more Right, because that, that faster than light travel things a bitch you know yes yeah <laughs> it's not, yeah, it's not like breaking the sound boring. barrier you know yeah. but like how fast can consciousness travel i mean you know there, there's all kinds of yeah that point. are yeah. out there um, and some of which we try to bring into the story where appropriate so you yeah. know one of one of the things I, I play with in my fiction is the idea that the old the elder things are dreaming and that the dreamlands are supposed to be their cyberspace. Oh, I like, yeah, I like that. 
just it, and the only reason humans are allowed in there is because we share some some structure with the people that created us mm -hmm. and the, the, the god ooh, that, that came out bad the um <laughs> the gods of the dreamlands are the elder things they're playing at being gods in their own private little virtual reality. Virtual reality. That's interesting. One of the things that, you know, this is one of the things I'm not, you know, I'm honor bound not to talk about it in any detail. But, you know, Jason and I started talking, what we both were drawn to this whole thing by the, the things that were unsaid and undealt with and you know, hinted at in the Mountains of Madness. So we, that's where we started to go. One of the things that bothered me and kind of bothered Jason too, and kind of what you're saying kind of is bumping into that area is, so here are these guys are walking around this abandoned, ancient abandoned city and it's dead, the dead city. And they're, and they're looking at all these hieroglyphs and carvings and they're overcome by this constant uh, feeling of dread, right? From deep down in their soul. Yep. What's so dreadful about old stone carvings? Well, it's you so know, maybe maybe the, the what you just said that you know we're we're tinkering with is the idea that there's there's a connection there, right? You know the shared dream space, let's call it, because otherwise it's like okay, it's it's a carving, but they're like it, there's a constant narrative in this story in the Mountains of Madness. Is they were just looking at that stuff, they were terrified. It, right. It's described as a sense of dread, so. We 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 uh we're we're dealing with that. <laughs> hey Rick. Hey Rick. Hi guys. Hi guys. No problem. No problem. Good to see you. So Good to be here. Matt asked this a little bit ago, but I'm not quite sure. It, maybe we can elaborate on this a little bit. So you know, fast forward to next year's Necronomicon. Uh, they're <laughs> getting three CDs, a booklet. Can you? maybe paint a little bit more of a word picture of what what people will be getting when they get this uh, we're yeah uh, <laughs> right, 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 right. no okay no, no we're, we're talking we're we're that's part of the the you know in the, in the background as we get near the, the bringing this to conclusion jason and i and, and of course uh, steve and fred have been discussing that and we're starting to look around at options uh I'll, I'll just speak for myself and then Jason Jason can virtually kick me under the table if I say something odd. but it you know well sort of roughly speaking there's there will be the the CD the, the CDs uh, a book or a book uh, uh, we're toying with different ideas for the book because one idea for the book is Peter's psalmody uh you know Fred some Fred's you know, technical, you know, writings about the thing that elaborate and, you know, uh, to me enhance the, what they're hearing and seeing, you know, and then Steve's artwork, which, you know, you know, you can, you can squash it down into a little tiny picture inside of a CD thing, which, you know, but, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, some sort of a, a worthy, uh, presentation for the artwork. Cause that's, as you guys, you know, have been pointing out and, and, and uh, talking about is that that's a that's a really that's one of the one of the things that to me stand it all stands out but one of the things that you know people have never seen before is artwork like that yeah and then you know partly you know partly then Jason and I are trying to create the world and all this stuff going on with sound and then you know like Peter and, and Fred you know their their writing is amazing in terms of uh, you know, kind of a, a narrative. It's like, okay, you hear the sounds, you see the art, and then you can read, you know, like a novel or something. This is what's going on. So we're hoping it's, it's the thing, but it'll be some variant of that, I think. The other thing to consider maybe, and maybe you guys probably already have, is will there be a, uh, a hardcover? I mean, excuse me, a hard uh, real world edition of this you know, the CDs, for example, and then will there be like a, a digital edition? You know, HP Lovecraft Historical Society, for example, yeah. their, their audio dramas, they do, they do the CDs and then they do um, props and so on and so forth. Yeah. And that costs X amount of dollars. 
And, but if you just want the story in MP3, in an MP3 um, and digital only, it costs you less, but you get what you pay for, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. They were planning on doing a release to a, the making of, you know, because, you know, like, like this emerged in this conversation. There's a lot of moving parts and a lot of weird stuff that's gone into that. So we thought, and, and some, some fun we've had and are having. Yeah. So we thought that would be a, an interesting enhancement too, to include in, you know, what's going to be available at the con. Yeah. You know, I, I'm sort of reminded of, so years ago, um, the artist, uh, Lori Anderson, for her uh, Puppet Motel uh, album, she, you could take the CD and you could pop it into your CD player and it played music. But if you popped it into your computer, yeah, yeah. you got a lot more. You got video and animation and images and po you know text. Um, so there's all that that can be done. And then most recently, was it the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society did that that those readings where it came out on that on yep. a jump drive? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They're they're pretty cool. They've got yeah, them on the are. jump drive, and it actually it looks like a a book. And then inside, on the left side, they've got it's like a, a library card, and they've got different authors with their signatures, like like Durleth and Lovecraft, and it's pretty cool. They gave me one. So yeah, so there's a lot of opportunities here, and, and you know, we just have to figure out what we want to do. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we're, uh, we're, you know, we're, I, I really respect. You know, here's what we want to do, and you know, instead of getting every aspect of it perfect in our minds before we even do anything that's you know perfectionism can stop a project cold mm -hmm. and, but if you just jump into it and then go we're going to feel our way as we go along and we know that by the time that we get to the end of this thing we, we are going to have something that's as closest to perfect as we can get yeah yeah, yeah. i mean that's great and it, the, the thing is it you know okay so it has to be adaptable into future media because, you know, I got a new car last year and it doesn't have a CD player. <laughs> like, what the? I have cases and cases and cases of CDs. Right. <laughs> right. And I don't have a CD player in my car anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have a tape deck. Doesn't have a tape deck. Doesn't have an 8-track. USB. Yeah, it has a USB and and a Bluetooth and a Bluetooth. Bluetooth, yeah. Well, it, another thing interesting you should say that. Um, firstly, it's it's definitely good to have a uh, an electric electronic uh, version of this thing. That's um, the easiest and cheapest thing to do. Right. I mean, it, but then again, I mean, it's going to be bare bones. I mean, it's it's not going to be quite the experience that the physical prep you know representation of thing of this thing is going to be right, um, right so it's like for instance you have this book and you can read the psalmody you can read the science you can see these pictures you can hit while you're listening to the music you can hear it you can experience it you can see it and you can believe it um and if you want to just pop it in and and you know you know just read it on the computer okay cool that's that's fine too um, I think you can't dance to it. Yeah, I would. I would personally love to kind of like. I, I guess kind of like maybe like the full gamut of art that Steve wants to express here um, in the project when we get to planning that out. Um, I think there would probably be more in the book than there would be in the uh, electronic version, but there might be like a couple of other things like screensavers on uh, yeah. wallpaper on the electronic version that aren't on you know so it's to kind That's of vary and give a little bit of everyone a little something you know interesting out of the project or a little unique um because this thing i mean this thing has just changed and evolved so much that it's it's not going to stop doing that until we literally close the lid on it so it's going to become yeah until it stops becoming. <laughs> you mean, you so mean that which is not dead can internal lie? 
Correct. Exactly. Exactly. Correct. So this is exactly the sort of thing that, you know, I'm not even sure what phrase I want to use. You know, you got a lot of, you got a lot of uh, folks like me who are into weird fiction and cosmic horror. And I have so many Lovecraft uh, stories written by Lovecraft that I just really, really like, really love. Shadow Out of Time is probably my favorite, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if you want to, I only think, the only phrase that comes to mind is like hardcore Lovecraftian. People who are like Sandy Peterson or P or you guys who love getting into the minutia of Lovecraft's universe, loves Lovecraft's creations. This kind of project really, really appeals to them. And there are a lot of people like that you know, uh, and, and the number is growing. So, so one of the best books I picked up in the last year was the one of the, it was something that I passed at Necronomicon. And I only picked it up because it was like a buck on somebody's website. It was the Necronomicon, you know, the Necronomicon. Cookbook. It's a cookbook. But the artwork I mentioned is, Kevin Komodo's art. Yeah. The, it, the Kevin Komodo's art is just incredible. And you, I've tried some of the recipes. They're okay. <laughs> They're okay. But it's this weird book and it's a bestseller. People love that book. Well, it's like Rick says a lot about Cthulhu Wars. He gets them for the action fig for the figures. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's an interesting thing about that cookbook was because I first saw it years ago. Okay. And then it vanished and now there's a resurgence. That's one of the things that we're kind of curious to see too. There's a resurgence of interest in Lovecraft and some more serious efforts to do, uh, uh, you know, worthy movies. Um, uh, of the, the very, I'm looking forward to the Dunwich Horror one, of course, that's supposedly in the works. But, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, given my previous experience with Dean Stockwell and and Gidget, you know that's that was sort of a bomb. But, um, and her weird thing going on with the Necronomicon, but we'll just leave that there. But this is, you know one of the things that's interesting too is as I've gotten to know these guys right. and through their work is we, we all have a, a different thing that's motivating us. <laughs> Part of my thing is to of course to do a really quality. Uh, work in conjunction with these guys but my thing is through the art and through the music and in the narrative but especially through the music since that's what I'm doing I want I want to give people nightmares I mean I want this stuff to crawl into their head and evoke you know a strange journey evoke cosmic horror evoke something they've never experienced before you know so yeah so that's Jason and I are doing that but yeah, that that's yeah. That's well, you know, speak to that as far as the music, but, but you know, because there's certain, um, and Bridget can speak to this as well. You know, frequencies and tones yeah. yep. that bring more fear, um, that, that that cause you know a sense of unease and terror. Exactly. And yeah. we haven't heard from Bridget yet so far in this um, this particular chat. But Bridget, do you want to start this off, and then th these other you guys can finish it uh for you I, I don't know if you guys know bridget but but she's a she's oh, yeah. position so yep. yeah <laughs> yeah i was actually stewing over here thinking about how you were talking about culture and how do you how did you develop the musical language for this culture of these words honestly <laughs> that, that's an amazing <laughs> question um, that's a great question. That's amazing. You know, with, I mean, we have some of the piping sounds. We have, you know, for the Shagath stuff, I, I created for initially the um, the Secrets of Vanished Eons because there's a 24-minute piece on that called The Evolution of the Shagath, which was really just broke down that whole uh, chapter. Um, there were four main paragraphs in at the Mountains of Madness that really struck me about the Shagas, the creation, the cultivation, the acceleration where they begin to sort of learn their own, you know, learn a little more and um, 
you know, then they are allowed to, and then they revolt the revolution, and then they're resubjugated after attacking their masters. And the, the language of this project is just as much in sound and in texture as it is in music. And the music part of it really kind of is in the second half of the first disc, which is the Zothian episode. And that was handled by, it's sort of kind of like an, a more sort of industrial and percussive uh, approach with the synths being grainy and dirty and just thick and, um, and kind of just almost kind of gross sounding, you know, because I mean, these are giant like octopoid things. And um, so then it's, you know, also kind of in capture, capturing the enormity of, of what it is that's happening because this, you know, the elder things create this world and then the Zothians invade it and they don't like it. So it becomes very aggressive and very um, just, I, I mean, it's, you know, very, uh, I almost think of it as, as kind of like, a, I call it my lithium approach. You know, it's got a very rough edge to it. And um, it's just uh, something that needed to be a little bit science fiction, a little organic uh, and, and a little, um, I mean, people are going to listen to this. They're going to plug into it, and it's really going to trip their mm -hmm. own uh, vision and interpretation of of the events that are taking place. And that was really the idea of the whole thing: is to to show you the artwork, to show you these little details, to let you hear what it sounds like, and to have you understand it biologically. And still, much like Lovecraft, the way he writes things, not get everything. So yeah. it. It's just as much, it's just as important as to what you don't hear, what you don't see, as it is to what you do hear and what you do see. So it's, the approach was just to, to make it, um, and then, you know, of course, then with the, with the Yidians and with the Migo, it's going to be a very different approach to those sounds too, because they're different. You know, I mean, I, I didn't like the, the whole, well, you know, okay, well, they're going to fight the Indians and they're going to beat them and they're going to fight the Miko and they're not going to win. So it's just kind of like, okay, great. <laughs> what is that? You know, how do you approach that? What does that sound like? So each, each uh, organism, what it looks like, what it signifies, that's going to be taken into how the music is, you know, is approached with those particular um, episodes as well. And then also you have you have the um, elder things and what they are going through in their own evolution uh, to consider also. So it's it's very much uh, coming from all aspects of this thing and incorporating it into you know converging it really is is what I would say. And I I do a lot of the foundational sound design and you know a lot of mining for natural sounds and you know. I, I'm, I'm in my studio, but you know my synthesizers are here and all this other stuff. It, it's a it's a it's a weird thing. People have asked me that, and I, I don't ever feel like I come up with a a good uh, answer. But part of it's you know my weird imagination. Part of it's uh, just you know I, I go by by my my in, intuition. I read the stories. We talk about what this might sound like, and I just start fiddling around with sounds or listening to something and uh, you know, with, with a mind towards other, the other work we've done, you know, cause it has to be, you know, unless it's something brand new, it's, there's gotta be a consistency to it and the linguistic and narrative logic to it, or it's, it's you know, it's, it, well, it, we're, we're trying to take you on a journey. So it has to go from one point, but it, it's, it's, it's sort of, sort of that sort of thing, you know, all, and to me always with the, the, the idea, you know, my interest in wanting to evoke cosmic car, you know, I, if, if we do this really well, even with the more mundane parts, you know, if you're listening to this at night, you're not going to want to turn the lights off. Yeah. Uh, if, I, 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 if I can do that, I've, I've succeeded. Yeah. Sorry. I, I'm, 
that kind of brings me to what I wanted to ask. I don't want to swing back to Bridget because <laughs> you know, she's got far better musical questions to ask than me, I'm sure. But a couple comments and a question. First of all, I don't think I've mentioned this on the show before. It's like two or three months old, but uh, uh, Bridget has a group on Facebook now called, uh, uh, you can look it up, Haunting Melody Horror Music Group. And she's got a yes. really a lot of insightful uh, comments on horror movie soundtracks and so on and so forth. I, I did a special request the other day and asked her to to comment uh, on the movie on the, the soundtrack to the movie Signs. Um, mm. And I, I was blown away by what she came up with. So I wanted to let everybody know that ah. so if you're on Facebook, just search for Haunting Melody horror music group and um and so there's that it, it's really interesting stuff bridget um i want to oh, ask one you. sure i want to ask one question and then i want to swing it back over to bridget uh were you guys specifically um al jason looking for these like you know deep tonal uh tones that would specifically create unease uh, oh yeah where appropriate yeah yeah i, I okay. back in the day i started life as a let, let's just say mental health counselor right and so yeah it's part of my my training and then i played in a rock band for a while but you know i became mm -hmm. interested and exposed to psychoacoustics and the power of sound yeah. to you know, uh, to soothe, but also to aggravate, and, and especially to, in this case, to evoke fear, you know, and that's, to me, that, that, that's part of my interest from a long time ago, because nobody, nobody's really done that, you know, so we're doing that, but yeah, it's, 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 I'm mindful of it, you know, because a lot of what I do is I, I create some of the, the basic sound, you know, Jason will say, I need this a sound like this, or what's, what's the, uh, the, the trapezoid zone going to sound like when it turns on? You know, so I conjure and, and all that stuff. So, but those those principles that you you know you've touched on about the the effects of sound on the human psyche and the human the mood mm -hmm. are ever present in what I'm doing. It, you know, I may say, "Wow, this is a really cool sound," but if if I'm really trying to evoke something dark and ominous, and, and you know, this hair is going to stand up on the back of the neck, if it doesn't have that element in it, you know, that frequency, then I can't use it. You know, yeah, it's, 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 there's malice of forethought in, 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 in this sometimes, yeah. It was interesting. Uh, Richard Stanley lectured after they premiered um, The Color Out of Space at the film festival two years ago. And one of the things that was most interesting about his discussion was the sound design. And they used a lot of hypersonic and subsonic frequencies. Exactly, yeah. Really yeah, only yeah. get the sense That's of it through a movie theater. Yeah, subsonic especially is, is right. good for disturbing people. Let me kick it back over to Bridget. Have <laughs> any more comments and or questions along these lines, Bridget? And there's so much to this, well, you know, like the, the, the scientific yeah. stuff that Pete and Fred were talking about, and then and then uh, this mm -hmm. is extremely interesting as well. So it's yeah. been a while, but one of the things that I described some of the the music that I have heard was like industrial apocalypse, but the apocalypse of, is of a, a society of rusting giant metal insects. It's it's like you know those giant cranes you see on the on doing construction. Yes. You have those as living <laughs> beings, and you know trying to make music with their legs. Um, yeah. Just really, <laughs> really disturbing. That's a, okay, that's so, a wild so. image, right? There. <laughs> So well, Bridget, I was going to say, could you and your cat ears make some comments and questions? I, I, I keep trying to. Um, what I was going to say. <laughs> Danielle just said, go, girl. Is, <laughs> is that um, from what Al was saying about uh, psychology, and we talk a lot about expectations of the listener and how we have certain harmonic expectations expectations that have been built out through our human history of how we expect melodies to go, how we expect certain chords to resolve, you know, um, 
so that we can feel that peace at the end of the phrase or whatever. Our, our ears have expectations. And so much of horror music is maybe teasing with the expectations of the listener, but not giving us what we want. Exactly. Or, yeah. um, but if it's so far out there that it's not grounded a little bit, then it, it's not scary either. Yeah, so right. I wondered and what your thoughts would be on that. I mm-hmm. agree with that a hundred percent. You know, yeah, it's really funny. Good point. It, it, someone I had a conversation about this uh, just today, as a matter of fact, with someone. Um, it, it's it, it's it's not scary if it doesn't come uh, from a place that is humble or beautiful. So you know, uh, kind of like nature i mean we're dealing with a lot of that you know aspects of that here it's it's well nature um and from that you know there are alien aspects that enter so it's the the it's not always stemming from creatures or organisms sometimes it's weather Sometimes, you know, environmental, such as like the, the very first track takes place in outer space. So we, ha- you know, had to create that, had to, you know, simulate that in a way um, that is really going to, to make you feel like you are in that environment. So it's, you know, it's absolutely got to stem from a, something plausible or something, you know, natural and then become or introduce something that is strange or unnatural or you know not something that we're used to and that is what i mean i never looked at this particular album as a horror like cosmic horror type thing i look at it as like a cosmic national geographic you know like we we're we're kind of like it's a field study and um, but there are elements of it that are really going to disturb the hell out of people because it's just not native to us. And I wanted mm-hmm. to keep it on that level. Now, when you get the Zothian, when you introduce the Zothians and the Migo, that's different because these are aggressive, highly intelligent alien species. And it has to it has to tip the scale a little. It has to throw off the um, the, the the nature of it a little more. So it's it's what it changes the harmonics. Absolutely. Absolutely does. So there's, there's, there's mountains and valleys and, and, you know, a lot of intricate work. It's not just, you know, um, the dissonant chords. It's not just the, uh, the, 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 you know, jump scares or anything like that. It's just, it's something that's far more real and far more upsetting. If you are, really just kind of counting on there to be any kind of um, stability <laughs> where nor- normality is concerned because it's not normal. You know, it's not going to be normal to us. It's before us. It's what created us. And, you mm-hmm. know, and at the same time, it has to speak to all of those elements. So it may be overwhelming in that sense because, you know, they did accidentally create us. So it's uh, it's kind of tapping the uh, the primordial um, lizard brain, um, you know, in a, in a sense, and also speaking to the subconscious, but also sort of being you know being outwardly uh, what it is. Yeah, you, cool. you can have jump scares in in jump scares, so to speak, in music, and then you have music that creates this just sort of mounting unease and and sense of dread and yes. the other night i was really in the mood to watch signs again i hadn't seen it in a few years so so i send a uh uh facebook message to bridget and her husband whose name is also mike uh, i said hey it's kind of out of the blue but what are you guys doing you want to watch signs and she's like what do you mean and i'm like well she goes you know like on cast or something i was like well i was kind of thinking we could both rent the movie and hit hit the play button at exactly the same time and talk on <laughs> Facebook Instant Messenger. Yeah, but you know that's what we did, and that's exactly what we did. It was a lot of fun, and uh, but you know the, I asked her about this particular one because this is a really great example of a soundtrack that just 
build this mounting dread mm -hmm. and you almost it's very easy to almost not even notice that the music is there sometimes with yeah. repeating those three notes Bridget yes and, it's very yeah. subtle with the layering that he does um the lower like you're talking about really low rumbling that you more feel than hear um mm -hmm. And then there's also when you have really low notes and really high notes and not much in the middle, the ear wants to create something in the middle. It notices something's missing. And so oh, wow. it starts imagining things. Oh, wow. Trying to fill, the space. To fill that void in the yeah. sound. So yeah. when he's got these really, really low tones going on and then, yes, the very high, but, -da -but, -da -but, -da -but, -da but it's, the thing I, I really love about that score too is just like you said, you don't really notice the music unless you're supposed to, and that the music is serving a function and telling the narrative of the movie. It's not saying, hey, I'm cool 80s synthesizers. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love that too, but. <laughs> and the composer. Um, in, in the right context. Yeah, excuse me. I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say that the composer, James Newton Howard, he's not. It's, it's not about, look what a great composer I am. I'm going to overwhelm the movie. That's right. not what he's doing at all, you know? And so many great composers, that's exactly what they don't do is overwhelm the movie. Right. And I mean, you can have some synthesizer, really cool artificial stuff in there, but if it's overwhelming the movie, then what's the point? So. That's and really that's fascinating what you said, Bridget, about if there's no middle, I forget exactly the way that you said it, that, that, that you almost imagine it or, you, you know, you want it and you start to imagine that it's there. I, I've never heard that before. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah just the frequencies, you know, of the pitches. Yeah. Um, in harmony, there's a there's a certain structure that we, we want to hear that expands. Even when we're hearing a solo instrument, there's, if, if we're, we may hear over, tones or we may add undertones but especially when there's multiple instruments playing you know we we expect kind of over a spectrum so when you're exerting extreme highs and extreme lows and there's the middle, you, there is a, and you, oh i heard it no it wasn't there you just <laughs> yeah. yeah but well, it builds anxious anxiety because not yeah okay so uh any Bridget, any more comments or questions on the musical aspects that you want to throw out there? Yeah, for the the gear nerds and whatnot. So any recent discoveries that you're willing to share that aren't proprietary of of just, oh, that's a really cool patch that I created or or that's a um a really weird thing that I had to record the audio for <laughs> to to mix in there. Well, yeah. it, you know, with all of this being said, which is really just fantastic, you know, we, we well, firstly, we did play a lot with the the um, inclusion of, you know, certain frequencies and the extraction of certain frequencies. I mean, because really what this project needs you to do is to imagine um, it, it. I mean, it's it's just like part of the foundation. So it is definitely while you're listening to it, going to have the listener designed to have the listener subconsciously looking for things. Um, and that's, that's important. Um, as far as uh, any, I mean, what I, I don't, I, I never approached like a project like this um, as opposed to, like you said, with James Newton Howard, it's, it's not to overwhelm it. It's to add it as needed um, as it pertains to certain events that happen um, because it's, it's, it's not about my ability to write a song. It's about creating the space and the, you know, uh, you know, very, I guess I would say, um, What, what word am I trying to look for? You know, it's it's got to be very um, true to, you know, the source material. It's got to be, you know, without a doubt. So it's, 
it's missing things. It's kind of, you know, got an overabundance of certain things at certain times. It really tends to go with the flow of what's going on. It's never about, you know, like you said, um, <clears throat> writing to show what a great musician I am. Um, not that I, I think that to begin with, but it's, I mean, we're fans of this too. We So humble. We, yeah. Well, <laughs> it, serious. The reason that I'm doing this crazy, insane project in the first place is because I want to live in it. I want to hear it. I want to experience it. And if I didn't, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be doing this. We've been doing this since 2018. Um, and before that, it was 12 years for the first part. So it's, I mean, it's really a labor of Lovecraft. You know, it's, it's. <laughs> dark just, uh, I just want to really <laughs> briefly interrupt you, Jason, because you just made yeah. me think of, you know, 20 years ago when games like uh, Mist came out. Yeah. If you remember those, those, someone made a comment on a uh, AOL message board uh, <laughs> back then that, you know, that their, their theory was that these guys who created games like Myst and I forget the follow up uh, sequel game um, started with an R, I think. But they were they basically said, you know, I know exactly what these guys are doing. They're creating games that they wish other people were creating for them to play. Absolutely. And what you just said you just reminded me of that. Yeah, and the simple, simple answer to your question of the weirdest things, giant penguin. Nice. That's, <laughs> That's the, the, weirdest, the weirdest thing, I think, that <laughs> yeah, that there's, there's a lot of stuff that you know we worked up and conjured, but the just when you said that, it struck me the weirdest thing that I ever, you know, went after and collected was a giant penguin. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. I mean, we, we want to we wanna <laughs> hit all the points, you know, and, and, and all the little details from the stories. We want to hit all that. But at the same time, we don't want to overload it. So we have to pick and choose what we add and what we don't. Um, and I think what we add, the quality of what is added alludes to what is not there. So it's, I, I, I don't even know how to explain that. Um, but I'll just have to hear it. So, yeah, yeah the, I mean, in this album also, there there are um, hints and nods to other aspects of the mythology that I've created in other albums years ago. So there's like samples, bits and pieces of things. So this album will speak to everything else that has come before it and kind of bring it together, tie it together. And also allude to, you know, I mean, certain things that uh, that have not happened yet. But with this with this project, it's um, it's a I mean, I really uh, I should be getting paid to do this. the amount of work that has gone into it and the amount of thought and planning and blocking. Well, it really you know, blocks. that's the idea, too. Right. I know this is a labor of love, but, um, yes. you know, hopefully you will get a return on your time by you know, selling this in the near future. So. Well, that would be, uh, be nice, but it's yeah. it's really more about creating it and having it exceed my expectations. And so whenever I go to it, I'm o over my head with it. You know, Wait, we're, we're not getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Pete. I'm not, I'm not paying you either. Bro. By the way. <laughs> what? <laughs> Hey, well, I'm you. looking forward to hearing and experiencing this project. Well, yeah, me too. <laughs> there's, there's a, a uh, yeah. The, what these albums remind me of. So there's in in John Carpenter's The Thing. At the in the um, the dog pound scene, the, there's a piece that escapes and crawls up through the ceiling. It's got this tinkling it's kind of centipede sound you know, yeah. as, it, as it goes up. And, yeah. then, and then when Jennings turns and he's out there sitting in the snow and he opens up his mouth and that, that hollow moan comes out of a human body that has no right to produce that sound. Right. <laughs> right. So, uh, speaking of the thing, just uh, did you know that if you speak Norwegian, you, you, get, you, you learn the whole the story. The movie book. for you right at the what? beginning. Yes. So anyway, but these are, the, these are the two touchstones for me that when people are going to ask me, what does this sound like? It sounds like a whole album of The Thing. 
Yeah. And, you know, everyone's worked really, really hard to create something alien. And I think we did it. No, we definitely did it. We haven't done it yet. <laughs> well, I think, you know, I think Lovecraftians are really, really going to enjoy this. I want to wrap up, but before I do, I want to make sure, is there anything that, you know, in, any of us, me, Matt, Bridget, Pete, that have not asked Rick uh, that you want to cover before we finish up? Or did we get it all? I don't I, I'm kind question. of wondering, like, it sounds like you've been working on this for a long time. An enormous amount of work has gone into it. You're kind of targeting a release date. When do you think you'll be done? The day before. I mean, I can you in. know when Necronomicon is? <laughs> the day before. <laughs> Matt with the cold, hard questions. For me, for, for, me, for the writing part, uh, right now I'm in the Carboniferous. And I'm hoping to be done by the end of the year on the quaternary. So hopefully I'm about 2 million years done by the end of this year. <laughs> I had that on my bingo card. So as 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 I, I've done card. my religious tracks. So, you know, unless somebody wants more, I'm done. Yeah. When is Necronomicon next year? Do we have a date yet? August? I think it's on the 26th. It's usually around uh, Lovecraft's birthday, right? Somewhere yeah. around yeah. the 20th of August. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Which so you guys, you guys have a deadline, that's for sure. We should be well, done by May, then, just to be safe. Well, I mean, you know, honestly, with with the intensity and and the just the the sheer volume of what needs to be done, um, I'm at a we're at a piece now musically where really the and I'll just throw out a teaser. The um, the Yidians are sort of in pursuit of something that the Migo are in possession of. And there is a transference which occurs um, into a Migo. So this Migo then has to uh, kind of move through this cavern, you know, because they're, they're in the uh, North Hemisphere mining um, for, uh, you know, um, minerals that they can only find on this planet. And um, so it, it's, it's going to have to be sort of, you know, the, the sounds of, of what it would be from the perspective of Amigo running through this cave, trying to accomplish what it needs to accomplish to move the story along. And it's, uh, it's really hard. It takes a lot of time. Um, but I think ultimately we will have this, we will have this done before. Um, sometime I would say, hopefully, uh, I'm hoping early next year, um, Al and I are going to get together in person, change the energy up a little bit because we've been doing this sort of like back and forth, you know, long distance, really switch up the energy and go, you know, go to the wall with it. And um, because the, the, sort of denouement of this thing is uh is just enormous i mean really we're we're working up towards the uh you know wh why did they go back to why did they go back into hibernation what was left of them and um so there's going to be a very big uh piece there and yeah. we get we gotta if we don't switch it up we're you know we gotta we gotta speed it up a little bit you know, so changing the energy, I think, would create the the power that we need to um, exact the rest of this. Well, be so. sure to let me know um, so that I can let everybody else know when uh, when you have some more updates and you know, uh, and all that good stuff. Jason, so. is there a piece that we can post on the the easy? Absolutely. Absolutely, it's on it's on us uh, on SoundCloud. There's a there's a couple of pe uh, well, I think a couple of pieces posted, or just or maybe just one, which is the uh, the see the the last piece of of uh, the secrets of vanished eons is um, across black seas of infinity. The first piece of the first disc of the elder ones, which would technically be disc two, is um, uh, filtering down from the stars in quotations 
from across Black Seas of Infinity. So it literally actually has the end of that track in it. So it literally continues, you know, goes back in, in um, time for that. Shoot, shoot me so, that link when you get some time. Yeah, send, send oh, us- I'll, I'll shoot it to you when we're done here. Sure. Last thing I want to say is, uh, last but not least, and of course we've talked about it, but the artwork that I've seen for this project so far, Steve, is just amazing. Blows me away. It's really great stuff, man. Thank you. So, uh, you know, for anybody listening uh, and you haven't seen any of this art yet, you're in for a treat. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, I, I've got a couple of other topics to move on to. And you guys, I'm, we're, we're, we're probably going to wrap up in about 15 minutes. So, you guys are more than welcome to stay and be nerds with us for a few more sure. minutes if you want. <laughs> but, uh, thank. Uh, I do want to say thank you to all of you for coming on and talking about this. Um, Thanks for having the invite. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Really yeah, appreciate it. It sounds utterly fascinating. So appreciate it. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to get going. I have a crazy week coming up. No, no problem. Yeah, same, that. same here, but thanks again, Mike Thank and Bridget good. and Matt and Peter and all that. Good night, Thank guys. you everyone. So nice good to meet fun. all of you. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to meet you too. Thank good you. See you guys again. Take, Take care. care, everybody. Thank you. It, it's awfully nice of you guys to include Pete with this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always get this feeling. It's like it's like, oh God, Pete just ramrodded his way in here. We gotta do something, but you know, I don't know. Well, it's, it's funny, funny, Pete. You came up to me at just a little, uh, a really very heartwarming thing. Um, Pete came up to me at uh, at the 2019 Necronomicon um, because I was on a panel there, the music of the spheres. And um, he came up to me and he said, you know what? He said, you know, yeah, I I name dropped. He said, but you know, you, you earned it. And it was really very sweet. And um, you know, when he, when he came to me and he said, you know, I, I want to write the, you know, the insert, it was just, yeah, do it. You know, so yeah, Pete. I mean, absolutely, you get included. Hey, I appreciate so, it. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you want? So, Bridget, I want to talk before Mike. While Mike's figuring out what he wants to talk about, I want to talk about my favorite favorite film. Okay, so my yes, favorite, my favorite film is Rear Window. It's not Alligator People. No, it's not Alligator. Thought it was Big Ass Spider. <laughs> but if Hold you on. watch Rear Window, there are three sources of natural music in the film. To the mm. right of his window is the guy composing the theme for Rear Window. Next door. Yeah. Yeah. To the, to the <sighs> left I never noticed the window, that. Wow. Yeah. The guy playing the piano. The 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 song he's composing is Lisa's theme. Who did the music for that movie? Was I that, don't know. Was it Bernard? Brown? I'll look it up. But to the it's left, been so long since I've seen it. But yeah, go on. To the left, out, out of his window, is Miss Torso, the ballet dancer, who's always playing music that she can dance to. And then in the middle is the older couple with the dog, and they have a little radio that they play. Well, you've had a lot of time to analyze this movie. Didn't you originally see it in the theater when it first came out? You have bite me, fanboy. <laughs> okay, wait, 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 Mike. Like, a, a, like 20 plus years ago, maybe longer, Isabel and I went to San Francisco for a visit. We went to the theater, the Castro Theater, which was one of those old, tiny velvet ropes, crushed velvet seats, huge theater seats, 1500, because they were showing a restored version of Rear Window. Oh, wow. And then we spent the next day like going to the Redwood Forest to the same place. And it was really, is incredible. What? I saw it in the theater in the 80s when they re-released a lot of Hitchcock's films because it was like 20 years. Mm. It had been Wait. gathering dust somewhere. Matt, are you confusing Rear Window with... Um, oh, no, Vertigo. You're right. Vertigo. Nuts. Never mind. <laughs> It's okay. An- another great movie, though. I love Vertigo. Both his shock films throwing Denise Stewart. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. My daughter 
okay, so I, I showed her rear window and she like caught all these things that I had never noticed before. She's like, oh, it's only three days. Like what? So like, yeah, the nurse that comes to visit them, she only has three costume changes. Like shit, I mm-hmm. never noticed that. But then she says, rear window ends with Jimmy Stewart hanging out the window and falling and breaking his other leg. Spoiler. Vertigo yeah. <laughs> starts with Jimmy Stewart hanging off the side of a building. She's smarter than you. I've always said it. I, I know. I said so. so, which I had never thought about those two films as, as bookends to each other. Which was made first. I, I believe Rear Window was first. Huh. Anyway, you know, right. it was a, the Grace Kelly was before Kim Novak. It's, yeah. it's pretty amazing how many times Rear Window's basic idea has been copied. Yeah, definitely. Oh, so I looked it up, by the way. It's Franz Wads- Waxman, sorry. Oh, Franz oh, Waxman was the familiar. What, what else did he write? Um, <laughs> IMDB is my friend. Uh, let's see. Rebecca, the Bride of Frankenstein with Karloff. Aha. Uh-huh. Um, huh. well, Shape of Water? Oh, really? Probably something that's in it. Yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah. Because he's credited as a writer, not as a composer, hmm. per se. I want to remind everybody that, it, it, you know, if you're watching, appreciate it. If you're listening I, later, I appreciate it. Um, maybe you're listening on Spotify or you download the episode or what, or YouTube or whatnot. But um, if you drop a review at uh, iTunes, that more than a lot of more than most things helps the show as far as the audio edition of the show so you know if you if you enjoy the podcast and even if you don't listen on itunes i'd really appreciate a uh you know a rating there a little maybe mini review or whatever you want to do so um thank you um next thing we're do- oh, yeah, yeah. who's watching chapel wait season five just dropped today you're not watching i got it no i i i'm on acorn right now so yeah well you you just want to wait till it's done so you can binge it exactly i'm kind of hoping that when it's all released i was going to show it um over a series of weeks with movie night oh, that's a good idea bridget, are you that's watching good it? idea rick i haven't seen it bridget no i'm binging several other things what the hell never okay never mind Echo. we're not going to talk about shop <laughs> weight I will tell you this, I don't want to give out any spoilers, but, you know, it's, it's supposedly based on, I mean, it is based on uh, Stephen King's story, Jerusalem's Lot, which is a very Lovecraftian story. And so I'm watching the first four episodes and I'm like, you know, this really isn't Lovecraftian. It's something else that I won't mention. Uh, but then in season, excuse me, in episode five, they dropped today. I thought, whoa, this is going Lovecraftian after all. I hope they keep up with us. So I, it, I guess it, I always viewed um, Jerusalem's Lot as a total pastiche knockoff. Throwing it out there, considering when it was written in his career, there's it's really I think August Derleth would have loved it. Yeah, I'm not saying it's my favorite Stephen King story, but I am enjoying Chapel Wake quite a bit. It's a well done use story that uses Derlis's tropes better than Derlis's use. Good way to put it. Yeah. Um, and his tropes go back to his first vampire story, back back Belfry. If you ever read Derlis, you see everything in there for the thing that ends up in the world after that, but it's right out of the movie. Other than those guy inherits the house stories. So here's a surprise. I was on YouTube the other day and I see something along the lines of coming tomorrow, the trailer for Matrix Resurrections. I'm like, what? How? What? What? I didn't know I didn't know this was happening. How did you know I knew this was happening? Huh? (laughs) 
I, I, I don't know. I guess. Hey, hey, Mike. Spoiler: Avatar Two is coming out. I don't care about <laughs> it. Too. Uh, I well, care. It's like, what about the Matrix? Now it's like we're all living in our own little bubble. Yeah, my world yeah, electronically. I have yet to even watch the trailer for Matrix Re uh, Resurrections, but who knows? Well, it's, it's great to come great. It's irrelevant at all right now. It's great to know that Neon, that, that, that Keanu Reeves' character was alive. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Um, there is, this is pretty cool. So speaking of Stephen King, um, I, and I posted this in the show notes, um, on YouTube. So Stephen King's got a new short story, I guess, called Red Screen. And it's on Humble, Humble Bundle. And if you pay at least, you can pay, you can pay what you want. It goes to, uh, Ooh. I'll pay exactly what I want. <laughs> you can pay what you want, five dollars or more. It uh, goes to charity. Um, but this is a, a brand new Stephen King story. What's it about? It is about it says uh in this unsettling short story, a cop interrogates a deranged plumber who just murdered his wife only to discover something far more insidious. So I've, I've linked that in the YouTube show notes. And it's only for the next three days, by the way. So if you're listening or watching this, you know, a week from now, you missed out. But maybe they'll do it in some other format. Well, I'm sure it'll be in a future collection, uh, having said that. So there's that. Um, I also noticed that um, I get an email every day for the... Uh, the dollar ninety nine, or you know, real inexpensive for one day Kindle books, and here's an interesting one: a dollar ninety nine today only on Kindle. It's called "The Science of Women in Horror: The Special Effects, Stunts, and True Stories Behind Your Favorite Fright Films." <laughs> uh, I think Rick and uh, well, I don't know. I think all of you this would interest you. So. Anyway, it's only $1.99. Uh, looks like there's a lot of old films represented here. You know, and plus newer things like Buffy and Sabrina, but also Haunting of Hill House and so forth. So, anyway, there's that. Um, I'll do this. I'll do this maybe next week, but I want to get into a documentary um, I'm just going to touch on it very briefly right now called missing 411 the hunted and this is on Amazon Prime uh, not to be confused with missing 411 with nothing after it that's that's pretty terrible missing 411 the hunted it, it's about it's this guy David uh, Pilates if I'm saying his last name right he used to be a cop and he investigates people who go missing under a certain set of circumstances that can't be explained. Now watching this and I was watching it again for the, for, I was watching it for the second time again today. Uh, the first case is pretty uh, strange, pretty weird. And so are a couple of other cases, a couple of me threw out there that I could think of a, possible um you know <laughs> normal explanation the thing that really got to me though in this um documentary was the last 20 to 25 minutes of it bridget have you seen this yes i watched it uh, several months ago yeah, yeah. So you know what i'm talking I loved about it. So it, it's where it's about, remember. This, um, it's about this and they don't disclose the exact location but they have they have footage and everything uh and it's in California somewhere in the deep woods, uh, mountains, whatever. It's really creepy. And it, it, these hunters that are extremely experienced and they repeatedly hear these sounds at night. And I, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, yes, I remember this part. 
Yeah, and, and there's I, there's like a fort, uh, like some kind of fort or yeah. structure that was there. Okay, yeah. and I remember which one you're. That was about. like listening to the recording in the whisper in the darkness in real life. Yeah, it's yes. really creepy. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, again, in the show notes, I've linked to a YouTube video preview of that part, but it doesn't really do it justice. And if you have Amazon Prime, it's it's free to watch. Even if you watched only the last 25 minutes or so of this documentary, yeah, it, it's just really creepy. And, you know, maybe there is an explanation that's very banal, but maybe there isn't. I don't know, but it's creepy as hell. And that interests me, you know? Mm -hmm. so, Some of what interested me in that documentary was not not just that people went missing and, and the circumstances, but when there would be random items that would show up years later in places that they weren't there when they were doing their original searches, that was really creepy. Yeah. Okay. Now, did you ever see, um, I think it was, was it a cry in the dark? The story of the case Meryl Streep starred in it. Uh, it was about the dingo that ate the baby. Um, and it's all about this trial obsessed Australia. This woman's lost her baby and she said a dingo took it, but there's no proof. And so now like the whole country thinks she's murdered her baby and she actually goes to trial mm. and on based on bogus evidence, she's convicted. And it was years later that uh, by chance a, uh, a hole got uncovered and her baby's blanket was in it. And it was a common practice for dingoes that were hunting to bury prey to go get it later. So it, Creepy. Is, it, was, a, it was actually a really heart wrenching movie. Well, yeah, not uh, only did you lose your child, her but you go to jail for, for it. And uh, till the evidence came through it, it was like, they had been over that whole area with a fine tooth comb how many times dozens and dozens and dozens and then all of a sudden they find this blanket what i yes what i respect about david Claudius is i never see him drawing any conclusions you know he just says this is what happened and i don't have an explanation for it you know he's not like who's the communion guy where it's aliens or it's this or it's that He's like, look, here's what happened. It's really weird. These guys dis disappeared or these weird noises happened. I don't have an explanation for it, but there it is. You know, in science, it's perfectly acceptable to say, in fact, it's what you're supposed to do when you don't know the answer to say, I don't know. You, don't, you know, you don't do the God of the gaps thing where, you know, <laughs> If, if if there's noise in the sky, it must be some big big guys up there fighting or something like that. It's okay to say, I don't know what's making that noise. You know, and, and that's what he does here. Um, so, you know, there's so much that we, in science, that we don't know. And that's that's part of science is the humility of it. Being able to say, this is, this is how far we've reached and this is what we don't understand and we hope to keep furthering our understanding but that last 20 to 25 minutes is is really creepy so i uh, i recommend the whole documentary but but that especially um so yeah i think that's all i got except uh to say that uh Oh, here's a, a book that my friend, well, he goes by the weirdling on um, Twitter, but he messaged me and talked, he said that he really enjoyed a book called uh, The Awakening, uh, The Darkness of Diggory Finch, number one. Uh, it's a very Lovecraftian book. That, um, that sounds very familiar. Says one part Stephen King, one part Kevin Smith, Twin Falls, a modern-day Lovecraftian universe of ancient eldritch evils, cults, monsters, and one very sarcastic young man that's just sick of being used, abused, and being self-destructive. 
so wait, who what was the name again? It's on Kindle Unlimited, uh, The Awakening, and it's by a guy by the name of Chris Philbrook, P H I L B R O O K. I don't I don't know this guy, but I plan on reading this book, and then if I like it, which sounds like I probably will, well maybe we'll get him on sometime. Um, so, but I want to uh, let everybody know about that. Mike, um, so, yeah, Rick. I got something. Yes. At some point after we've all seen the movie, we can have a lengthy discussion on Shang Chi and the Legend of, of the Ten Rings. Discussion about what? Shang Chi. The new Marvel movie. Oh, okay. Not just because it's superheroes, because it's something else. Yeah. Okay. And right. then, if you haven't seen Malignant, don't. Um, so? Well, read the Robert Block short story. It's not. Well, uh, Kelly said, you know, it looked good. It's on HBO Max. It's new and it looked good. And then Kelly's like, nah, it sucks. Yeah. So, it, so there is a Robert Block short story called in, in the mythos called The Mannequin. Yeah. Yeah. That is pretty much the same story. Well, is it a good movie? Do you disagree it, with Kelly? No, um, it's a popcorn film. The the last there's about five minutes that's really really scary, that kicks off the third act, mm-hmm. and then the third act is just um, uh, John Wick. The uh, mannequin was adopted for some anthology film once. Yeah, I, I found it on IMDb. I haven't seen the movie. All I know is The Night House is still not available on streaming. And and neither is Ant. This is me off. So. That's right. That's right. I'm angry. I also want to point out how wrong Matthew Carpenter is about the Hulu series Only Murders in the Building. Um. It's a. This is nothing. This is this is way off topic of the usual stuff. But it is. This is such a good, good series, mini series. Pete's looking at me like I haven't seen this crap. What is this? No, Steve I Martin. I, I'm just noticing that I'm getting sort of like Anton Arcane gray streaks right here. No, you're turning into Doctor Strange. Now that's, yes. that's been there for quite a while. <laughs> I, I just, are you talking about the arcane of the television series, the movie, or the uh, comic book? Uh, the comic book. Pete, look at my hair. It could be worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it could. Don't agree with me. Sure. No, you're right. <laughs> and then the whole beard's going gray, too. So. Well, yeah, I still got this little iron gray going right here. So. Very distinguished. Very distinguished. Yep. Let's see. What else do we got? Uh, uh, I, I, I would yes. mention that uh, Marvel's What If is becoming very horror oriented. Oh, yeah. right. I got to catch up. I think mm-hmm. the episode's behind. Yep. Thank you, Rick. The zombie. Listen, I okay. So the zombie episode, that was good. That was I haven't really seen good. that one yet. And. Uh, I love the yeah, I've seen that one yet either. Okay, then I'll never um, I won't I won't spoil it for anybody. I've I've seen the first two. Okay. The, the Doctor Strange one is also really good. Yeah, the Doctor Strange is is very nihilistic, oh, almost Legadian. Doctor Strange is that the third one? It's the fourth. One. Okay, so I haven't seen it. It's very, it's very nihilistic and Lagarde, and I'm going to love this. The third one is a murder mystery, which I'm not going to tell you who gets murdered. Okay. Do all these tie in together? Are you seeing these tie in mm-hmm. together? No? They're, no. Not in, they're not in the same era. Oh, okay. but there, may, there may be something that can cross uh, dimensions that is in two episodes. Yeah. All right. I'll catch up on what if, and I will tell you guys you should be watching chapel wait it's right. it's good do you have to do you have to rent that channel or uh yeah i think the first two episodes are on amazon prime and then you have to rent epics it's like five dollars a month though yeah. Even, yeah even my poor ass can afford it 
Well, I would wait. Till Bronzo it's, was like, it's the principle of the thing. I would wait till it's all finished and then I would write it. So what I've gotten into the habit of doing is just, you know, every month I rent a new channel. And if something's on special, that goes to the top of my list. And then I spend the whole month watching that channel. Yeah. And then I just move on. Hmm. That's right, DeBronzo. I'm talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any what, Anything you guys are watching or reading that you want to mention before we go? So I'm enjoying American Horror Stories season 10 so far. Stories or story? Story. Oh, that's season. Oh, season ten, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I well, it's in red tide right now because it's called double feature. It hasn't gone to the second. Is it any better than the first nine seasons? Uh, I mean, I there were certain seasons that I absolutely loved, and others that I just thought were okay. So I don't know how to answer that question. (laughs) (laughs) But I, I. I'm enjoying the season so far because it's there's a lot of tropes that they they taunt you with, but then they go in a different direction. It's a very unique vampire story. It does definitely get better after the the first second episode. Of course, then there's American Horror Stories, which is an episodic. Mm-hmm. Um, I watched Drive In. That's the only one I've seen. Drive-in's good. Um, bail. I thought bail. Bail. Mm. I think it's bail. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the? Did you like bail? Which which one's the best one? Oh God, I don't know if there's the best one, but I like I like because like Lord and I I like uh, I like movies that have kind of a I don't know put away without I don't know. Have a have a good uh, ending. <laughs> uh, I like was good, but good but campy, you know. Oh yeah, those are definitely campy. They're more along the lines of like creep show or you know, tales from the dark side or something like that. You don't necessarily go into them one in some deep kind of experience. They're just <laughs> oh, speaking of tales from campy the dark but side, fun. Weren't we just talking about but guys? in the in our thread about uh about yes. the uh raid on chong uh gargoyle episode yes yes I we were because I... I was young oh, God, yeah, younger, and i the... thought that was, was <laughs> awesome and who was that who was the, there was a uh, debbie harry right in the who did the overarching story i don't know and she was like a witch or something yeah she was the witch p- putting the kids into the the fire Oh, right. Right, yes. right, right. But that, you know, that, that gargoyle story has it always, really, yep. it, you know, say what you will. It's great. It's when a story just kind of sticks with you and you can't stop thinking about it, that's a successful story, you know? Yep. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I was watching um, Cellar Dweller yesterday and don't admit it. The first scene. <laughs> the, the first scene just brought immediately brought that episode, that story of Tales from the Dark Side back in my mind. So I obviously remembered it, but <laughs> All right, what's what's the prize again, Matt? Remember, it is this really nice graphic novel compilation of Criminal Macabre, Omnibus One. Remember to send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com and put macabre into the subject heading. And with that, I bid you all good night. Uh, we're, we're all even too. Thanks for being here, guys. And uh, everyone, thanks for watching. We'll, we'll be doing a Tuesday night old time radio as per usual, uh, most Tuesdays. And uh, we'll hopefully talk to most of you then. Good night. Good night.